This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Rejoice, for Christ is risen. We come to that point in our service where we lift up our joys and concerns to the Lord and to share those joys and concerns with our fellow worshipers. Let us pray. Risen Christ, Lord of life, breathe new life into us this day. Inspire us with confidence and open our hearts anew to receive your promise of resurrection. Speak to us once more that we might hear your voice and recognize your presence in our midst. From the darkness of doubt, guide us into the glorious light of faith and love. All these things we ask in the name of your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Our gospel lesson this morning comes from John's gospel, the 20th chapter, the 1st through the 18th verses, and that will be read by Ann Ballard. Blessed is this day, for he has risen. The gospel reading this morning is taken from the book of John, chapter 20, verses 1 through 18. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and one at the other foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabbani, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. The word of God for the people of God. Praise be to God.
My message this morning is entitled Cross-Eyed Triumph. And for those who haven't uh, regularly attended, our, our, our theme for our sermon has been cross-eyed, cross-eyed glory and, and cross-eyed other things. And it has nothing to do with, with a condition of your sight or your vision. It's cross, cross-eyed, the eyed upon the cross. Now, Mark was three years old when his pet lizard died. Now, since it was her grandson's first brush with death, Grandma suggested that Mark and an older boy in the family hold a funeral for the lizard. Now, Grandma explained what a funeral was, basically a ceremony where you say a prayer, sing a song, and bury your loved one. But Grandma even provided a shoebox for him and a burial place in the backyard. The boys thought it was a great idea, so they all proceeded to the backyard. Now, taking the lead, the older boy said a prayer. And then he turned, and he asked little Mark if he wouldn't like to sing a song. With tears in his eyes, Mark clasped his hands and bowed his head and belted out, Hit the Road, Jack, by Ray Charles. That's exactly what Pilate, Herod, the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, Caiaphas, Annas, and everyone else who had plotted the death of Jesus was singing on Friday. That was their fondest wish. Hit the road, Jesus, and don't come back no more. They wanted Jesus gone. They wanted him out of their lives forever. So they nailed him to a cross and they watched him die. Then they sealed him in a tomb and walked away singing to themselves, Don't you come back no more. They were through. Pilate had washed his hands of the whole affair. Everyone else returned to their places and it was business as usual. But it wasn't really, was it? Sure, the day started out in darkness, but it ended in light. It started in despair, but it ended in hope. It started with tragedy, but ended in triumph. A cross-eyed triumph that shines forth from the empty tomb even today. As we continue our journey of cross-eyed faith, by focusing on and through the cross, we celebrate the day of cross-eyed triumph. Now, can you imagine how surprised the disciples must have been? It had to be a Gomer Pyle moment. Surprise, surprise, surprise. <laughs> now, I read portions of a sermon titled Astonished and Astounded, written by a Lutheran pastor. In it, he said, there are certain times in life when the word surprised is not enough. You need bigger words. Now, on Easter morning, we need stronger words, a constellation of powerful words like astonished and astounded and dazzled and dumbfounded and awestruck and amazed. The event that day when the stone was rolled away was so incredible our language can't even begin to encompass the true meaning of that day. We've been trying for 2,018 years. 2,018 years. Imagine that. 2,018 Easter's to try and explain what happened that first Easter day. Think of all the pulpits from which that message has been proclaimed, and yet it still astounds us. It still amazes us, doesn't it? Now, when the disciples heard Mary's incredible story, they ran as fast as they could to the tomb. They stooped down, they looked in, and there they saw the burial clothes lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head rolled up in a place by itself. And they believed. This morning we come from all kinds of places with all kinds of needs and desires and with all kinds of fears and burdens. Some of us have come running and we're, we're out of breath. 
Some of us have come because we've been dragged here by family or friends or by the force of some need in our lives. Some of us have come because this is what you do on Easter Sunday. Some of us come seeking hope in a seemingly endless world. Some of us come simply to be reminded. But whatever the reason, God wants us to stoop down and look into the empty tomb, just like John did. God wants us to stoop down and to look in and to believe. It doesn't make any difference what we thought when we first got here. It doesn't make any difference if we don't recognize the risen Christ at first, like Mary. What matters is that we let his light illuminate the tomb so we can see that it's empty. And because the tomb is empty, our lives can be full. Because the tomb is empty, our lives can be full. Full of grace, full of mercy, full of love, full of the knowledge that no matter what we've done, the Son of God offers us forgiveness rather than condemnation, hope rather than despair, and life eternal rather than death. We might have come empty today, but we'll leave full if we stoop, look into the empty tomb, and believe. Now, I have to warn you, there are a lot of things in the world to distract us from the triumph, the power, and the joy of this day. There are the physical things that would have us focus on them rather than on our faith. There are relationships that would distract us from our primary relationship with God. And there are lots of other ideas and theologies the world throws at us to distract us from the hope and the promise of this day. Some of those ideas and theologies were rejected by the early church because they didn't mesh with what the Gospels or the eyewitnesses revealed about the life and the ministry of Jesus. Or they were rejected because they denied the basic teachings both of and about Jesus. For example, here's Mary Magdalene. This is the same Mary who appears as Jesus' wife and lover in both The Last Temptation of Christ and in Dan Brown's Da Vinci Code. Both are great novels. Both are great works of fiction. Both authors used ancient Gnostic Gospels as sources for their ideas. Do you know what the Gnostics believed or why the church rejected their versions of the Gospel? Well, it's really quite simple. First of all, the books that contain these stories of Jesus and Mary were all written 40 or 50 years after the latest date given by scholars to the writing of the actual Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John that's a pretty good reason but it's not the only reason the main reason is that the Gnostics believed that while Jesus was the Son of God and completely God he only appeared to be human appeared they denied the incarnation they denied that Jesus was both God and human at the same time Jesus only appearing to be human meant he didn't really eat or sleep. He didn't really leave footprints when he walked. He didn't really know what it was like to be one of us. And to top it off, they believed that Jesus didn't really die on the cross. He only appeared to die on the cross so that we would believe. And he wasn't really buried because he wasn't really dead. And because he wasn't really dead, he didn't really rise from the dead. Now, I don't know about you, but in my mind, that's an awful lot of wasn't and didn't reallys for someone to swallow and still maintain their belief in Christ as Savior. Besides that, it doesn't really match up with what the other gospel writers and people like Paul and Peter, James and John all have to say as eyewitnesses. There are those who would claim that the church has perpetrated some secret cover-up of the true events of the day. 
The only cover-up was put out by the perpetrators of Jesus' death. If you'll look at Matthew 28, 11 through 15, basically it says the guards scattered. A few of them went and told the high priest everything, who called a meeting and came up with a plan. And they bribed the soldiers and told them to tell everyone Jesus' disciples came during the night and stole his body while they were asleep. Now, don't worry about getting into trouble for sleeping on duty. We'll square that with the governor. The soldiers took the bribe, and that cooked-up story is still going around today. But we believe and know differently, don't we? We're here because we believe and know differently. Well, so what? Does it really make any difference? Absolutely. Or you wouldn't be here. It makes a great deal of difference, doesn't it? You see, we live in a Good Friday world. A world filled with suffering, anguish, pain, sorrow, sin, and death. It gets played out around us every single day. Sometimes it gets played out in our own lives. And that's why the message of Easter is so important. It reminds us that we are resurrection people. People of the rolled stone, people of the empty tomb, we are Easter people. Easter reminds us that Good Friday doesn't have the last word. God has the last word, and that word is Jesus. Jesus raised him from the dead with the promise of eternal life for all who follow him. Jesus, full of hope. Jesus, who through God's Holy Spirit wraps us in God's love, mercy, and grace. Jesus, whose strength fills us and fuels our souls. Jesus, who walks with us and even carries us if need be when we go through that valley of the shadow of death. Jesus, who gave his life for us so we could experience the weightlessness of forgiveness and both the joy and the hope of resurrection. In the movie, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, the great lion, Aslan, sacrifices himself so Edmund, one of the sons of Adam, might live. It's dawn. Morning is coming. Lucy and Susan, Edmund's sisters, have spent the night crying over the dead body of Aslan. As the dawn begins to break, Lucy notices mice all over Aslan's body. Susan reacts with revulsion. But Lucy sees that the mice are gnawing at the ropes that the white witch used to bind Aslan. Eventually, the mice cut through the ropes and they fall away. Finally, when they can cry no more, Susan tells Lucy that they should go. And Lucy says, I am so cold. So they get up and walk away, but suddenly there's an earthquake and a terrible, terrible cracking sound, and the girls turn around and they see the stone table broken in two, and Aslan's body nowhere to be seen. They're confused. They want to know what has happened. And as the sun rises in the east, they look up and suddenly, with the rays of the rising sun glittering in his mane, Aslan emerges resurrected. The girls are overcome with joy. They shout out his name. Aslan comes down to greet them. They're all laughing. But practical Susan has to ask. But we saw the knife. We saw the witch. But Aslan interrupts. If the witch knew the true meaning of sacrifice, she may have interpreted the deep magic differently. When a willing victim who has committed no treachery is killed in a traitor's stead, the stone table will crack and even death itself will turn backward. Now Susan tells Adlin that they sent word of his death to Peter and Edmund who'd gone to war. And Aslan says he'll help, but that they won't go alone. He has the girls climb on his back. They'll have to ride. And just before he leaps into action, he tells them to cover their ears, and he lets out a tremendous roar. In real life, I don't think it was a mighty roar that the world heard. 
I don't think it was a shout of joy or the hallelujah chorus. I think what the world heard and felt was the deep rumble and thunder of God's laughter. It may have been the laughter that rolled the stone away. I think God laughed because the joke was on sin and death. They were defeated. They were defeated and they still don't know it. They want us to live in Good Friday when we're the Easter people, the people of cross-eyed triumph. And that's the difference it makes. The tomb no longer frightens us, for we've been forgiven, and we've been given the promise of eternal life. And once you've experienced the weightlessness of forgiveness, you can face anything. One more quick story and I'm done. Chris Moretz decided to ride out Hurricane Katrina alone at home. After the worst of the storm had passed, his house was flooded and destroyed. Chris needed to let his family know that he was still alive, but they were in Tucson, Arizona, and there was no way for him to contact them. So Chris painted the message on the roof of his home, see, Moretz is alive, pass it on. Also included was the phone number of Chris's brother, Gerard. Now, Gerard said going 36 hours not knowing if he was okay puts things in perspective. As those hours passed, I certainly saw many images on the news that were very disturbing. Unfortunately, you tend to imagine scenarios that don't have a happy ending. You're trying to balance that with being hopeful. Some hours passed, but then Chris's rooftop message was shown on TV and posted on some websites. And Chris's family began getting phone calls from all over the country telling them that Chris was alive. We live in a Good Friday world, but we are Easter people. We look at the world with cross-eyed triumph in our eyes. Through the cross of Christ, we see a world which is illuminated by the light shining forth from the empty tomb. For the early church, the message was simple. Jesus is alive. Pass it on. For us, the message is the same. Jesus is alive. Pass it on. Live your cross-eyed faith. Live the cross-eyed triumph of this day. Wrap yourself in the weightlessness of your forgiveness and the hope of resurrection. Wrap yourself in the grace and love of God. Be the Easter people. Jesus is alive. Pass it on. Amen.